Hello everyone and welcome for another video of Love and War Games. In this video, we will take a look at one of the releases of September 2022, which was the Archimedes Battle Fleet for the Covenant of the Enlightened. In this video, we will see each of the options uh, that you can build with the different miniatures that you will find inside this box set and how each of them play and what uh, we think that you should uh, build or not depending on what you want to do with your fleet So before we have a closer look at everything that is inside the box Let's talk quickly about the enlightened uh, as a faction First of all, uh, they are really uh, elite faction in the sense that they are the masters of the technology that has spread around the world and thus they have really good weapon good ships and good tricks left and right uh, on average uh, an enlightened ship will be better than the equivalent of another faction. However, they usually have little downsides that are um, sometimes harder to spot, or they can be a little bit trickier to use, or they can be more fragile. But ba basically, they will do what other factions do just better. They have a lot of tricks, a lot of weapons that are very different to the other factions, but are usually better, and most of their ships are versatile. Their carriers can be used as good uh, fighting ships. Uh, some of their uh, main cruisers can launch uh, SRS squadron, this kind of thing. So they are very good once you know how to play them. It is a little bit less of a uh, beginner's friendly uh, faction because of all the combos that you can find. And they are, ha however, uh, most of their ships are really masters either at point blank or at extreme range in the sense that uh, their shi the ships that want to be at point blank, once they are there, they are great in fray or in just raw firepower, sometimes even better than the Prussians, who are the other masters at this range. And their ships at extreme range can really put a lot of damage, as we will see in a minute. But yeah, they are quite either are quite specialized, but they are still versatile, if you see what I mean. They are extremely good at what they do, but they can do other things, which explains why they pay a premium for their ships. Now, let's have a look at what you get inside this Archimedes battle fleet. As you can see, you get a lot of stuff, uh, and it is for quite a reasonable price. Uh, it is 85 pounds, so that's going to be a little bit less than 100 euros. But you do get a little bit of every single sprue that exists right now for the Covenant of the Enlightened, and it's really a great box to start. It is not a one-player starter set, uh, as we've seen for other, other factions, um, but even if a one-player starter set were to arrive for the Enlightened, and uh, by the time you watch this video, probably it exists, uh, even though it's not a one-player starter set, the Archimedes Battle Fleet is basically a one-player starter set on steroids. Like, it's just so good, and you get everything that you need to play the common faction. Uh, first of all, you get one of the Vault ships that can be built as an Archimedes, which is the name of the battle fleet, or a Nansen, or the Schneider, which is a named version of the Archimedes. You also get a sprue like allowing you to build two Covenant frontline cruisers, which are the, let's say, basic default cruisers that we you've known uh, since the first starter set, the Hunt for the Prometheus. With those, you have a lot of options. You can build uh, Lovelace or Stiletto, Antarctica, Copernicus, Shetley, or Ulysses, which are like each time like heavy or light version of the main cruisers, uh, the artillery cruisers, or the SRS cruisers. Then you can also build two Covenant support cruisers. Um, you can build the Claudius, which is the smallest one, the Tessitus that has an amazing freight capacity, the Plinius, the aircraft carrier, or the Quintilian with its uh, extreme range missiles. Then you have two advanced cruisers, which are the most recent sprues that have been released, with the Newton that can teleport stuff, the Vesalius, which can send uh, whales kind of like the Descartes, the Azumina that boosts uh, friendly ships, and the Origen that allows to repair the small automatas. Finally, no, not finally, <laughs> even more, you get two assault machines, the Ketos or the Lotan, which are these uh, sort of millipedes, uh, insectoid uh, machines, very cool uh, looking and uh, very powerful as well. You get six frigates, uh, either Merian or Gemenzobek, or with the latest uh, Orbit, we will see they have even more variations now. Those are also miniatures that you've known since the hunt for the Prometheus. 
you get six Covenant submarines, uh, which are a bit more recent. Either the Diogenes that can send a lot of torpedoes or the Praxilla with their little drills. And finally, eight tokens. You get two Escort tokens. Very good, very useful. Two Orcas and Physiteers token, which are the small and the big whales, basically, that can be sent around. And finally, two SRS tokens to be sent left or right. Okay, that is a lot. Uh, let's have a look at each of them. It's going to be a little bit longer video than usual, but that's just because, as you can see, there are so many choices. And don't worry, at the end, there will be some least uh, propositions, so you're not lost. First, the main ship. And wow, what a beauty it is. I mean, just look at it. To, to be honest, it's when I saw this ship that I was like, okay, I want to play <laughs> Enlightened. Uh, what do you have? You have the Archimedes, which is this one on the left. And uh, it, it is expensive. It is These ships are mass 4, so they are on the pricier hand of the scale. Don't compare them to the Descartes or the uh, Ipatia of the same faction. Those are significantly stronger, but also much more expensive. If you have a look at the Archimedes, it's 388 points. So that is a lot of points, even at 2000 points. Uh, but it is going to be like the centerpiece of your fleet. Uh, it has a lot of tricks with its main uh, reactor here. There are two of them that you can uh, swap. I will not go too much in uh, details, but both of them are, can be very powerful if you know how to use it. And uh, anyway, it is a good ship, like a good frontal uh, brawler ship. It has a flag barrage. It has uh, three um, particle beamers that can shoot uh, forward. And it's just overall a great ship. It has a lot of uh, firepower. It is more resilient than you would think because it also has Luminiferous defenses, uh, which means that even if it doesn't have the defensive stat lines of a Congo, uh, it will be able to shoot down most of the uh, enemy firepower. And now with the latest Orbat, uh, it can start the game Wave Lurking, which is great because Wave Lurking gives you a defensive advantage on the first turn. And this is really something that you want, because uh, usually if your enemy at the first uh, turn, they could try to alpha strike the Archimedes before it could go below the waves. Uh, this way you can really uh, wave lurk, which is a great boost for the Enlightened faction in general. Then you have the Schneider, and the Schneider is a named version of the Archimedes, much more expensive at 455 points. It has a, a set loadout, about the. it cannot change its main uh, reactor here. It has three Sturgenium Agitators, uh, which is which means that it really wants to be at point blank. And uh, it has like an insane capacity of boarding. Like it, it, Probably it is the ship with the best uh, boarding in the entire game. It has all the keywords that it could want for boarding, like sustained, uh, longer range, devastating, as I do, like everything. And if it tries to board a ship, it will be destroyed. And anyway, it has three Sturgenium Agitators just in case it needed a little bit more. Uh, good that it is so efficient, because at this price, you would expect it to be. Uh, it also has... Uh, fortunes of war which would be a great thing but then you think to yourself okay if i keep it uh, in strategic reserves because i want it to come from the side uh, to not be focused down and then it can just board whatever i want it's a good option but however this ship has fortunes of war and if you do this the first uh, two turns you will not be able to use fortunes of war so that's an interesting question. Do you keep the Schneider on the board with fortunes of war and you make it wave lurk or do you keep it in reserve so it really can make an impact? That is a decision that you will make at each game. What I would recommend is like if there is a target that would really like your Schneider to be at point blank uh, quickly on turn two, like a big enemy carrier, put it in reserve. Okay, very well. And uh, do your thing on the big enemy uh, target in the rear. Otherwise, if the enemy is more like average fleet, uh, put it on the board and use your uh, fortunes of war. Finally, we have the Nansen, which is this uh, version with, as an aircraft carrier. Uh, it is much cheaper at 335 points. Uh, to be fair, this is the version that I personally prefer. Uh, first of all, it looks amazing. And uh, it, does, it is not as uh, tricky to use as the other two because it doesn't have this big generator. It just has good SRS capacity, like good firepower. It has elite crew. Uh, and Vanguard, which makes it kind of be okay for Frey, like it is a, a threat. 
Vanguard and Wave Lurking is great because you will uh, be able to deploy much later than most of your opponent's fleet and then you can make a Vanguard move to really be sure that you can put your SRS token where they need to be on the first turn in order to trigger some combos and you get logistical support which gives you uh, another card which is always very very important. So overall for 335 points, a really good ship. And if you don't know what to build and you are kind of like beginning the faction, first of all, don't glue this. Like you can magnetize it or even without magnetizing, it's re relatively easy to swap out even from the Archimedes to the Nansen, for example. So don't glue it. And if you're starting to learn the Enlightened faction, start with the Nansen. It is much easier to use than the other two. I mean, to use efficiently. Then let's have a look at the frontline cruisers. So there are six of them. We will first see the three light variations and then we will see the heavier variations. Uh, basically, the light variations uh, have a smaller turret in the rear. And they, of course, the rules change a little bit, but that's how you recognize them. The stiletto is the basic version of the cruiser. As you can see, it doesn't have anything here in the center. And it has only a small turret in the aft. So it means it is the stiletto. Uh, now that we know how to recognize, what does it do? It is fast, like really fast. Uh, it, <laughs> with the full steam ahead and its uh, basic speed, it can reach speed 14, uh, which is great, <laughs> especially uh, if you uh, put a Sturgenium Agitator on it, uh, because Sturgenium Agitators are weapons that want to be at point blank. Uh, this is a ship that is relatively fragile for its uh, point uh, cost. It's 82 points, but it will be deleted fast if it is focused. So it is a very good idea to put it wave lurking on first turn uh, also, because it will be close to the enemy very fast. And uh, yeah, best to use on the flanks to uh, uh, fight uh, softer targets. And it does this very well. And then you have the Copernicus with its heavy particle cannon here that uh, can be replaced with other even more esoteric weapons. I will not describe them here. Yeah, all of these uh, big weapons are extremely efficient. It is uh, basically just a support for this heavy particle cannon because other ships have the same weapon, but they have other packages. This is 133 points. You might think it is very expensive, but when you have a look at the stat line of this heavy particle cannon, you will understand why it is so expensive. This is the cheaper, uh, the cheaper platform on which you can put a heavy particle cannon and if you uh, want just one uh, artillery ship it is a very good choice to have a Copernicus. Uh, it's easy to pilot you just point it at the enemy and the uh, heavy particle cannon which can shoot only forward like in the frontal arc uh, will have its target. It's very good. If you start to want to focus a little bit more on uh, particle cannons or artillery ships, there are better options, as we will see later, uh, for example, in the form of the Antarctica. Then you have the Châtelet, which is the uh, SRS uh, variant. It is a scout ship. It has Vanguard and a single SRS token, and it costs 90 points. Uh, how I see this... Um, cruiser being used. Uh, mostly it is to trigger combos with the artillery ships, uh, with cruise missiles for example, that have the rule spotter and they really want to have um, SRS token on their target on turn 1 and your enemy might try to keep its uh, interesting targets away from you. Uh, you can by having one Châtelet in your list make sure that you will trigger your combo. Uh, how to do that? You put, first of all, your Châtelet wave lurking, so you can deploy it quite late. Uh, that's already a good thing. And even if your enemy tries to stay away from your own uh, deployment line, uh, first of all, your Châtelet can redeploy, can deploy at the end of the, as, as a submerged unit, as close to the enemy as possible. And then it can make a Vanguard move, and then it can send a, its SRS token when it activates 40 inches. So you have effectively a threat range of 45 inches from your deployment line. and It should be enough to be able to put the SRS token on your opponent. So yeah, it's really the ship that you put when you have a lot of quintillion ships, for example, that we will see later. And you really want to trigger spotter for sure on turn one. But it's not a ship that I would uh, spam. Then we have the Lovelace. The Lovelace, everybody <laughs> knows them. If you've been playing for a little bit, they are ships that were seen a lot uh, since the hunt uh, for the Prometheus, the very first box set. It's the basic cruiser of the Enlightened. 
Uh, they're good. They're good. Uh, they cost 96 points. They have good firepower. Depends again of which ship you put. Uh, lots of their ships. Uh, oh, sorry, lots of their turrets are very good at closing or point blank range. Uh, you have the particle beamer that is better at like all the ranges, and uh, most of the time you want to be at closing range at least. Uh, what you need to be careful with is that it costs 96 points, but it is not uh, Kutsov or all these uh, solid mass 2 cruisers of the other factions. Uh, it has some uh, defensive tricks. Uh, for example, it can be wave lurking, it has its entropic generator that helps a little bit, or it can have, for example, its luminiferous defenses. But if your opponent focus a lot of firepower on them, they will uh, be uh, killed like in a one salvo, by powerful ships, uh, no questions asked. Uh, they're efficient against like smaller attacks, but as soon as the enemy starts to focus its firepower, they will die fast. So be careful with that, but other than that, they're good. Like if you're not sure what to build, do I want our Tactica? I don't want to make uh, combos, so I don't need Chatley, etc. You don't know what to do. Uh, Lovelaces are always good ships to put on the front line. Just be careful how you play them, but they're very good as a default uh, variation. Um, yeah, the Covenant can be sometimes tricky to play, and the Lovelace are one of the easiest ones to play, so good choice. Then you have the Antarctica, and oh boy, <laughs> it is expensive, it costs 150 points, which is uh, a lot. Uh, it is harder to pilot than the Copernicus, because uh, it has a better turret in the rear, uh, and it's a particle beamer at least, and you can upgrade it of course, so the heavy particle can, can shoot only in the front, so it's sometimes a little bit hard to make sure that you can have targets for your heavy particle cannons and your torpedoes, and at the same time shoot with your rear turret, so it can be a little bit harder, you're like, eh. But why do you want Antarcticas? Uh, if you start to pack a few of those, uh, this unit has heavy firepower. It is a valor effect that allows you to... Um, how do you say, to combine uh, the firepower of up to three heavy particle cannons at maximum efficiency. And this means that if you manage to trigger this, it's an expensive combo because it costs you a card and it's 450 points, but if you do this, you will have a blast template and basically anything under it is dead. <laughs> or at least it will be extremely crippled. Like It's just such a devastating attack and uh, yeah, it, it is very dangerous for your enemy. Uh, and it's very fun for you when it happens and it goes good. But yeah, it, it is expensive combo and uh, it is more for more experienced players, let's say, because Antarcticas are fragile for their cost. But uh, yeah, it's just very good option. If you start to have, for example, few boxes like the Hunt for the Prometheus and the Starter Set and the Archimedes box, etc. Always try to keep two or three Antarcticas because it's just such a fun combo to, to trigger. Uh, that you will want to do this at least once. Uh, if you don't want to buy three Antarcticas, you can have the named version, the Belgica, which is 20 points uh, more expensive. Uh, it has a lot of little things more, and especially it gets a shield generator, which helps to compensate uh, its uh, fragility. And if you want to have only one Antarctica, a Belgica is a good uh, option, as a very good, very strong frontline cruiser with a heavy particle cannon. And finally, we arrive at the uh, Ulysses, which is the last of the frontline cruisers. Uh, it is kind of like the Châtelet. It does not have uh, Vanguard and stuff, but what it does get is Anti-Air Specialist. Uh, it is costs more at 110 points. It is more resilient at Armor 6 with Anthropic Generator. Uh, so it means that your enemy will need 7 hits to start to cause uh, damage. Great. And especially with all its weapons, and it, uh, let's remember that the Enlightened can have very good uh, weapons, and this, gu this guy Ulysses has uh, two big turrets. Uh, they can really like point at uh, some aerial unit that think they are uh, safe uh, like a little bit at closing range, for example. And no, they will absolutely be slaughtered by the Ulysses. So very good anti-air ship. Also has... Um, a little SRS token to trigger spotter, so uh, overall a very good ship to have one or two of, uh, especially since there are more and more aerial units being released, and uh, Ulysses uh, worth will only increase with time. Now let's have a look at the support cruiser, so starting here it's another sprue uh, that you can uh, use. 
what can you do with support cruisers? You can have the Plinius, which is uh, basically an aircraft carrier, but since the Covenant don't do anything like the other factions, it's not like a basic aircraft carrier with a little rocket battery just to say hi. Uh, no, this is what I call the battle carrier, because this uh, this carrier can shoot down other mass two cruisers, battle like battle cruisers, uh, in face to face combat. It has a quite good uh, firepower. It has torpedo, some rockets, like a lot of things, and uh, it has good start line. Yeah, it doesn't degrade as bad as other carriers when it is uh, crippled, and it does get cloud hunting. So yeah, it has a lot of stuff for 137 points. And it will just, on overall, like right now, it is a very good uh, ship to, to build. If you're not sure what to build with your support cruisers, I would highly recommend at least one or two Pliniuses. Uh, they're just great overall. Uh, Covenant SRS Togan are very good in attack because they are harder to shoot down. Uh, it has a good firepower, it has good torpedoes, good rockets. Like Overall, like just, uh, just build it. Like It's great for 137 points. Uh, yep, just a great model, plus it looks so cool. You can also build uh, quintillions. So these things uh, are kind of the same as the Plinius, so good firepower again. But it does get uh, a generator in the rear, and it loses the SRS, of course, and it gets these cyclonic uh, missiles. Uh, first of all, the name is cool, and this thing uh, is an extreme range blast template that is just so powerful if you can trigger a combo. So it does get a spotter, so if there is SRS token where you were shooting, you get some bonuses. Uh, we'll see a little bit later, but it can uh, be comboed with uh, Zoomina, for example, to even further increase this firepower. It does have limited ammunition, which means every time you shoot, there is a chance that either of your missile silos will run out of ammunition. One chance out of six. If you have a Zoomina nearby, which is a support uh, cruiser, we'll see later. Um, you can reroll this, so you only have one chance out of 36 to run out of munition. Much better. And uh, yeah, you you can really uh, get the boost of the Zumina, uh, have two or even three quintillions, and have this extreme range threat that will <laughs> just terrify your opponent because there is not much they can do to protect themselves from these uh, cyclonic cruise missiles. So even a single quintillion is a threat, but if you start to make the combo, they are really, really devastating. And uh, some of the best extreme range firepower that any faction can get. It is the same price as the Plinius at 137 points. So it really depends, like, do you want to trigger the combo and make the combo that will uh, devastate your opponent? Or do you want to play the Plinius, which is a little bit easier to, as a point and click and send SRS everywhere uh, ship? Or you can just combine both of them, because they go very well together as well. Then you get the Tacitus. Tacitus also 137 points. And this one, even though it is a support uh, cruiser, a quotation mark, this guy just wants to run at the enemy and just bore them. It has a crazy amount of firepower, uh, frontal firepower. It's even better than uh, Lovelace or maybe even the Antarctica because it has all these small weapons pointing forward. It has good uh, little generator. It has a Frey 9. It has Lamarckian Barracks, which is the same keywords as we've seen for the on the Schneider earlier, which is uh, <laughs> insane. The, uh, a single one of them is a crazy uh, boarding threat, especially if you can keep it in strategic reserves. If you start to have two or three of those, well, it sucks to be your opponent. Like, it's really hard to deal with this. It is not that resilient, so be careful with that. But uh, yeah, just really fun ship to use. And But you need to have a plan on how to get them in point-blank range because your opponent will try to focus it down. Th this ship has amazing uh, damage capacity, but it is very, very fragile for its uh, point cost, and especially for, because of where it wants to be. There are a few ways to get in point-blank range. Uh, as we said, a strategic reserve, or you can use one of the main flagships within Archimedes, for example. They have some tricks to teleport units around. Uh, the Newton can help to get a little bit closer, or they can get turbo encabulation drives, which can help them to do some teleportation uh, shenanigans. Uh, it can be a little bit risky, this turbo encabulation, because you can lose the entire unit. There are ways uh, with uh, some support uh, cruisers to mitigate this, but still it is a risk. 
and you're not sure to arrive where you want. But yeah, as soon as you are where you want, it's going to be very, very efficient. And just a fun trivia, turbo angabulation is uh, basically a word that they used in some uh, British uh, science circles to say like when something just has a funky science name and we have no idea how it works and what it does. <laughs> Funny that they called it like this. Finally, for the support cruisers, you have the Claudius, which is, as you, if you compare, like it's basically the same ships as the other ones, but without any specificity. Because you pay 65 points for the base, it is a utility ship, it has supply depot, useful freight, which already is a good combo, uh, especially useful freight, it allows you to play a little bit better with your cards, and it has minesweeper, and it has okay firepower, and for 65 points I really, really like it, and they have an option to be actually a Q-ship, which means you pay 80 points, your opponent doesn't know which of the Claudius is the Q-ship, it's gonna... Just gonna, he's just going to know when you activate it. And then you can choose one Claudius that is still in battle ready state, which means it, it is not crippled. And then you can transform it into either one of the Tacitus, Plinius, or Quintilian, which is the three ships we've seen just before. Uh, it can be great uh, if you manage to do this, because, uh, well, if you manage to transform a, a Claudius that was just uh, not a very interesting target into a Tacitus uh, that really wants to be in point blank, that can really be a bad surprise for your opponent. Uh, but that's the only thing I can see as a good thing with a Q-ship. Uh, Plinius and Quintilians want to be on the board on turn one, so they can use their extreme range firepower, either SRS, either cyclonic missiles, from turn one. And the big risk is that if your Claudius is crippled, it can no longer turn into a Tacitus. And if you had only one uh, Claudius, it means you pay the Q ship for nothing. So you kind of lose 80 points. And Claudius are fragile ships. So if you swarm the board with Claudius, like you have, like I don't know, three of those in different units, uh, can be a nice, fun tactic. But if you're just beginning the faction, I would not recommend uh, to do that. However, what I do recommend absolutely, if you want, is to have one Claudius, because the supply depot is good and useful freight is great, and Minesweeper is also useful uh, many times, so, and it's a cheap activation, 65 points for Covenant is very cheap, so one Claudius that is not a Q ship is a very good option. And we are not done yet, now we will have a look at the advanced cruisers. Uh, first in the list, and not my favorite, is the Newton. It used to be really bad, and now it's a little bit better. Uh, basically, it has a, some sort of generator, it's not really a generator, th that allows it to play with teleportation, basically. Uh, now you can see what the effect is going to be and then choose a target, and because before it was really random, you, there are some benefits or negative effects that you can have, and uh, you had to choose a target before. So you could put a benefit on the enemy, or you could put uh, some negative thing on your friend. It was too random. Now it still is random. There is a dice roll to see what happens. Uh, but at least you can see what's going to happen before you choose a target. So it's a little bit more reliable. But for 126 points, it is too situational uh, to be uh, efficient. I mean, it, it is a fragile ship. It, it's not a frontline brawler, it is not uh, Antarctica or anything like this. Uh, it will get crippled very fast, and when it gets crippled, it cannot do its uh, teleportation shenanigans anymore. And uh, yeah, then you just pay the ship for nothing. It doesn't have like yeah good firepower, it's like eh. Uh, it is a fun ship, uh, don't get me wrong. If you're playing like a very friendly list and you're like, okay, I want to play a new turn, see what happens, it can do some hilarious stuff, like just uh, switching ships uh, left and right and putting them like... Front, uh, front to the island so they crash next turn etc it can be fun it can be fun absolutely but uh, right now it is too expensive for uh, what it does if it were much cheaper uh, almost like the claudius that we've seen before like something much much cheaper uh, it would be fine it doesn't have firepower it has a funny uh, capacity okay but right now i would really not recommend it then you have the Vesalius, okay, and this is a whole other story. Uh, it, more expensive, at 130 points, um, basically no firepower, eh? But, but, it uh, can send some, uh, like, killer whales uh, tokens, either the Fissetiers, either the Orcas, and it, they work a little bit like SRS token, with a little bit shorter ranges, especially the Fissetier, which has very uh, short range. And, uh, but however, they are just so uh, good, so efficient. Um, the Orcas, 
but basically you send five uh, you have five dices per orca token uh, within 35 inches and you can have three tokens per uh, Vesalius which is great uh, the difference with uh, the usual SRS token is that they can not be intercepted so yeah it's really a big threat on your enemy they cannot do much to protect themselves from it great damage or you can use fissiteers like these big single whales and they now do boarding actions with a lot of good keywords and a lot of dices so that is um, also really really efficient they have five dices each uh, in boarding which will make sure that you have a very good chance on whichever you are targeting especially if you start to combine with like two uh, Vesalius or if you have the special uh, Covenant Battle Fleet that allows you to buy some extra Fisetier tokens uh, very good uh, tricks to do with either Orcas, either Fisetiers uh, however, the Vesalius is fragile and it has ridiculous firepower in the sense like it has nothing so actually you should play this a little bit more than a normal uh, aircraft carrier uh, unlike the Plinius that we've seen can be a very good frontline ship as well uh, like a bit in the rear but it can uh, trade uh, firepower with other ships this one no, just hide it behind an island uh, make sure it is safe and uh, like hope for the best it is also last thing, mine layer uh, which means that you can put little mines left and right to try to hurt the enemy and uh, that is always a good thing, so don't feel bad if you bring two or three Vesalius uh, in any confrontation. And we finish with the advanced cruisers with the Zumina and the Origin, two good ships uh, in different uh, categories. The Zumina is a support ship, again, almost no firepower, but it costs only 60 points, very cheap, a very good uh, chip activation, which the Covenant like. Uh, it can be attached to a unit. Uh, every turn it can remove a disorder tokens on ships around. Very good. Uh, it allows to reroll the blanks on the turbo angabulators, which is the teleportation device, which is invaluable because blanks on the turbo angabulators means your entire unit dies, which can be very bad as you can imagine. So being able to reroll blanks is great. I would not try turbo angabulators uh, unless I have a zoom in around. Or except if it's really like the end of the game, it, it's your last chance, etc. But usually, if you plan on having turbo encabulators, get a zoom in now around. And it also allows you to reroll blanks on the limited uh, ammunition weapons, such as the cyclonic missiles. Just this, uh, like for uh, already, it's great uh, for 60 points. And what uh, is not written here, but what they can also do, they can boost the firepower of ships around them. So... By doing this, uh, the receiving ships that are boosted, they have a little bit too much power that they receive and they get a disorder token, which is fine because let's remember that next turn, like next time they activate the Zoomina will remove a disorder condition again, so that's fine. And plus, uh, being able to boost attacks such as the cyclonic missiles is just invaluable. Or even, like, for example, the heavy particle cannons or this kind of thing. Like, these weapons that have one attack that they really want to boost because they have blast templates, Boosting them with the Zumina is just so good, so very efficient. However, a little thing to be aware of is that uh, if the Zumina is destroyed, uh, then every single ship within 3 inches will suffer a catastrophic explosion. Not just a point of damage, a catastrophic explosion. So 2 points of damage, disorders, be very careful with that. Uh, the range of your boost is 4 inches and the explosion is 3 inches. So be very careful to always try to stay at... Uh, four inches, but not three inches of uh, the ships you want to boost. Uh, it can be difficult if you're a new player. It's okay, like just take the risk, and it's plus it's fun when it, there is this big boom of the Zumina. But uh, yeah, if you start to play a little bit more competitively, uh, do learn to put the Zumina at just the right uh, distance so it can boost but not be a threat. Then you have the Origins. The Origin uh, is there for one thing and one thing only. It's here to boost your automatas. So mostly like the Mass 1 frigates, such as the Mirian, and the submarines, such as the Diogenes and the Proxillas. Uh, the Origin is really a force multiplier because the automatas are uh, fragile. Uh, however, what the Origin does, basically it gives you uh, one chance out of three Every time a mass one dies around it, within 10 inches, I think, uh, it allows the uh, mass one to stay alive with one hull point. Uh, 
Uh, this can be great because you can start to have like six or 12 automatas around you and they already uh, can be uh, annoying to remove because they can be submerged either by being submarines or by wave lurking and they're a great threat and uh, but you don't want to focus your firepower on them so they're already already a little bit annoying to remove and if you give them a uh, a 5 plus uh, plus chance to stay alive uh, basically like they become ex a huge annoyance so the origin is really a force multiplier for your uh, frigates we will see the frigates and uh, basically all the automatas a little bit later but always uh, keep in mind when we talk about the automatas and the mass ones that you can have a origin to help them uh, staying alive uh, it can also repair ships it has advanced repair facilities uh, which is good to remove some critical damage or some disorder, that kind of thing. And it has science of the enlightened, which means that on top of that, when it tries to repair ships around, it can give them back some hull points, which is also very good, especially if you start to give back hull points to uh, best one that you just revived. It can be really annoying for your opponent. And it costs only 62 points. So again, one of the cheap activations. It has basically no firepower or anything, but it's just a good ship to uh, have in general. And we finish the mass twos with the assault machines. Damn, this is going to be a long video. I am sorry, I'm trying to be a little bit detailed in case you uh, have questions. Uh, there are two variations. They are quite uh, similar to each other in the sense that they can both shoot and do a little bit of ramming action. Uh, the Ketos is more focused on shooting. You can see the Sturginium Agitator here. Uh, it can deep strike and uh, shoot good and do some ramming. Uh, however, it has a Sturginium Agitator, so it really wants to come with a strategic reserve. So it can use its uh, Sturginium Agitator, which is actually boosted. It has more dice than it is sustained. And it really wants to use it at full capacity as soon as it arrives. So it doesn't really want to use unexpected arrival. It wants to use a uh, strategic reserve which can be uh, can be fine depending on what your opponent is but just uh, remember to to do that uh, because both of these uh, creatures are expensive at 148 or 156 they're expensive but they are fragile like if they start to get uh, firepower they will die very fast they are, don't have a great defensive profile they don't have that many hull points so be careful with that. Don't think that your Ketos can just appear in the middle of the enemy fleet and stay alive until the next turn for your next activation easily. Uh, no, better to have a very impactful arrival thanks to strategic reserve and uh, well then it did what it needed to do. Uh, don't forget that it, they also get a uh, mine layer which is always good. Mines are great especially now it's uh, it basically time dice, dices per uh, mass of the ship that triggers them so they can really like do a lot of damage at the mines don't forget them and both of these uh, creatures when they are crippled they lose a lot of firepower yes but you can decide to trigger the apocalypse protocol which means as a special operation they can uh, do a valor effect which makes them basically uh, self implode or like just sacrifice themselves and every ship in range get uh, they get two catastrophic explosion which means four damages, uh, two points of uh, morale, which can trigger even more uh, damages. It can really be a devastating uh, attack for your opponent. So don't forget it if your ships, if your creatures are uh, crippled. Then you have the Lotan, which does not have the Sturginium Agitator. It has this little thing, so it's, it is better at ramming. But it cannot shoot, like it has some little shooting attack on its belly, but uh, you know, they are not that efficient. It can try to shoot with its heavy particle cannon, but it is going to be a valor effect to trigger this. So is it really worth it? Uh, if you have three Lotans in a unit, yes, it is worth it. Absolutely do that. Uh, only a single Lotan, I'm not sure it is really worth it. Uh, however, the low 10, since uh, it doesn't care that much about shooting, it is very efficient, uh, much more efficient with unexpected arrival. Uh, so it can just ram uh, as soon as it arrives. And uh, this way, if your opponent tries to stay away from the side of the board uh, to protect himself from your deep strike attack, uh, the low 10 is better suited to go in the middle of the table and still go to find these carriers or whatever that is trying to survive the second turn. So a little bit... Uh, a choice here. Personally, I prefer the Ketos because uh, you can use it uh, 
with strategic reserves and it really is going to do a lot of damage. But the Lotan is a little bit easier to use because you just care about unexpected arrival and that's it. Then let's have a look at the frigates. So there are four variations that you can have for the honorable mass one frigates. The Merian that everybody knows and three other variants we'll see in a minute. The Merian, uh, as most of the other variants, are great at point blank because most of the Covenant weapon are great at uh, point blank uh, range. Uh, thus, you will really want to have one way so you can bring your frigates at uh, point blank range. Uh, strategic reserve is always good. You can use your flagships with some chrono devices to teleport there, or you can use your turbo and cabulation as, as we've seen earlier. You have choices uh, in the Covenant to teleport units around, uh, one way or another, and you will want to do that probably with the frigates. Uh, or you can just put a origin uh, cruiser to repair them around and just use them as some sort of distraction carnifex uh, because they will take much more firepower than they are supposed to to die, especially with the origin. And uh, then it protects your other ship. Both ways uh, work. Uh, there are lots of variants of these mass one ships. Uh, you can b bring two units for each battle fleet. Uh, that is quite good because most of the time you can only bring one of each uh, unit type per battle fleet. So that uh, impacts your lease construction. Uh, that is going to be fine. The Merian is great at point blank, it can shoot very efficiently. Uh, you have also the Germain, which is actually better uh, at longer range because it has a particle beamer, which is uh, quite uh, good if you just want to do a little bit of fire support. Again, I love the Germain with Origen because you can really stay a little bit in the back. And if yeah, if they wave lurk and have Origen uh, next to them and they just keep shooting, uh, your enemy will waste firepower to shoot at them. I mean, they will die at some point, but your enemy will get frustrated shooting at them. And if they shoot at your wave lurking Germain <laughs> at a long range with Origen, uh, it's good firepower that is not uh, pointed at your other more fragile ships that will actually do most of the damage. So good little combo, 6 Germain with the origin. And uh, yeah, I didn't put uh, pictures uh, yet because we don't uh, have them uh, really yet. But you have the Kaidin and the Prevost, which are two of the variants, uh, kind of like the Merian. They also want to be at point blank, so everything we said about the Merian still work with these two variants that have other weapons, such as, uh, for example, a little Sturginium Agitator. Now, and to finish these uh, units, we have the submarines, the Diogenes and the Praxilas. Uh, the Diogenes uh, have torpedoes, so they can shoot at long range. They're, these are small torpedoes, so only long range. But it's great for a little uh, submarine at 35 points. Uh, they are relatively fragile, but they do uh, pack a punch. They have a pack hunter, so if you have six of them, uh, and you can build six of them with this Archimedes box, uh, they will uh, pull their weight. Uh, if you bring an Origen, um, that is going to be a very good co uh, combo again, because everything we said about uh, the Germain uh, in the back uh, wave lurking is going to apply with the Diogenes, except the Diogenes is a submarine, so they are always going to be kind of wave lurking. Uh, if you really want to be annoying to your opponent, you bring six Diogenes and six uh, Germain, and you just keep them in the back with the Origen, or even two Origen, to protect them, and then it's just just not fun for your opponent anymore. It's just like, but why don't they die? And it can be fun to play, but just something to keep in mind for you. And yeah, I really love the Diogenes as a cheap-ish unit uh, for fire support in the rear. And then you have the other side, like completely other side, the Praxillas, which are here to, for their ramming action with their cool little drills that have, uh, I forgot the name of the drill, but it sounds very cool and scientific. <laughs> and they have good ramming attack and they cost only 38 points. And yeah, basically you want to have a lot of these small uh, submarines to just go and uh, start to uh, eat away the uh, opponent ships, which is why <laughs> they should have been called Piranhas because that's really how they're gonna be, just lined up and starting to go on all the length of the opponent's ship, uh, they those absolutely need a way to get uh, in range because they don't want to be in point blank. They want to be ramming, so don't just make them cross the board. Either strategic reserve, turbo encabulators, everything we said, blah blah. 
they absolutely need it even more than the other ships that we've been talking about otherwise they are relatively fragile and they will die to the first blast template or something like this that will point them they are very efficient they have piercing which means that you, uh, if you play your cards well you can inflict six uh, critical damage to the opponent with piercing uh, which means that they are actually, and it's quite fluffy, they can absolutely devastate an Ice Maiden by triggering a lot of um, critical damage that uh, the Ice Maiden is especially vulnerable to uh, with piercing. So that can be... Uh, <laughs> six uh, Proxillas in uh, Strategic Reserve can absolutely terrify an Ice Maiden. And uh, since it is basically just a giant uh, ice cube and they have these little drills, I just think that like yeah guys if you do at some point manage to send six Praxillas on an ice maiden just take pictures and share with us on the discord or the facebook group because i absolutely want to see that good little ships are the Praxillas, especially now that they have tools to get uh, where they want to be and that's it we arrive at the <laughs> least example that has been a while talking about all the different variations i hope you have a better understanding of each unit and you will understand a little bit better of uh, these list examples. One thing that I want to uh, uh, say is that you have only one flagship uh, in this box, which is going to, of course, orientate a little bit the construction of the list. Uh, I made a legal list at 1500 points uh, that you can play, absolutely. Uh, but the other list, especially this one, you do have more than 2,000 points in the single Archimedes uh, battle fleet box. Uh, by the way, you can have a look at the battle report I did. We did make a battle report against the Commonwealth with the entire box of the Archimedes battle fleet and it was very fun to play. So if you want to see how it plays, uh, have a look at this battle report. But if you want a legal list, if you go to a tournament or you just want to have a legal list, uh, you can try to do this, for example. It's relatively easy to play. You start with an Ensign with two Escorts at the base of the ship. You have two Antarcticas. Let's remember that they can use uh, heavy firepower for their um, heavy particle cannons. And those are your front lines. Uh, don't rush them, they are quite fragile still. You have six Diogenes in the back because, as I said, they are very good as a rear uh, fire support. As you're, some of your damage dealers, you have two Quintillions um, cruise missiles uh, with the Zumina that will boost them. Uh, that is also quite expensive, but that will do a lot of work. And then finally, as threat, you have two Lotans uh, uh, in a single unit. And these uh, guys will uh, do a lot of damage on turn two uh, when they will appear uh, anywhere, on <laughs> preferably next to an enemy carrier or something like this. Uh, how to play this list? Play it relatively defensively on the first turn. Do a lot of damage with the Quintillion, your SRS token, your torpedoes and stuff. And then on second turn, when your Lotan can arrive, then you can close in for the kill. Um, not sure it's the most competitive list that you could do, but it's very fun. Relatively easy to pilot uh, as an enlightened fleet and uh, just, uh, just good fun for both you and for your opponent. On the other side of the spectrum, if you want to make the jump to 2000 points and try to play with all the miniatures that you have in the box, uh, it's not going to be that much more. You just had six uh, Mirren class frigates. Um, on top of the Diogenes and the Vesalius, and uh, you transform your Nensen into a Schneider, which is much more expensive, uh, but it's going to be a real fun also to play. Uh, play it quite conservatively, but in the center of the board, it's not that fast. Start wave lurking with the Schneider. Don't make the mistake that uh, my opponent did in the battle report. Put it in the middle of the map so the enemy cannot ignore it. And there you will have 2000 points. And uh, it's not a legal list, but it's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, it is actually a list very similar to this that was played in the battle report. Like, there are some differences. But yeah, if you want to see how this played, we do have a battle report with this. Uh, not exactly the same list, but close enough. And then finally, uh, one thing I wanted to point out is if you start to want to be a little bit more, uh, how to say, competitive, you can have a basic uh, enlightened fleet that is not there. For example, if you play at 2,000 points, you can have 1,000 points of classic Enlightened Force, like, uh, I don't know, Descartes or Anipatia and this kind of thing, uh, just uh, doing their business. And if you manage to find 1,000 points of Strategic Reserves, you can have this absolutely devastating package in Strategic Reserve, uh, the Schneider with two Escorts, 
which is your big damage dealer. It has three Strogenium Agitators, uh, and it will just devastate anything it gets in fray with. So that's a huge threat on turn two. Also two Ketos, uh, either in, as a single unit, or you can even spread them out as two different uh, units. Even better, actually, I think. And uh, those things will shoot with their Strogenium Agitator as well at full capacity when they arrive. Great. And six Praxilla Submarines, those with the little drills, uh, as a unit of six, or yeah, as a unit of six is the best. And they can also devastate something with their ramming action on turn two. So it's not the whole list, this uh, that you can see in the middle, but as a complement to uh, another half of an uh, enlightened force, this is absolutely dirty uh, strategic reserve force that you can uh, play if you are in a more competitive environment. Because uh, I'll be honest, I have no idea how to counter this. The Schneider and two Ketos and six Praxillas is like, you're basically telling your opponent, yeah, turn two, you're going to have a lot of things that are going to die, and you don't have many ways to protect yourself from that. Uh, yeah, but it's still fun, still fun. And that is it. It was a very long uh, video. I think it's the longest what to build video, video we've uh, ever done. But there were a lot of things to talk about, as you've seen. Uh, if you are hearing this, well, thank you for staying all the way until the end. I hope it was uh, clear enough. Uh, we did this with the latest version of the Orbit of the Covenant, so it should uh, be up to date uh, for a while, hopefully. If you have any question, any remark, or you think I'm wrong about something, or you want to say thank you or anything, do let us know in the comments. Uh, also, uh, give us a thumbs up so other players uh, can see this video thanks to the YouTube algorithm, or even people that are new to the game can see this and learn about dystopian wars and be interested. So thank you for that. And if you are not a subscriber yet, well, please do uh, start to subscribe so you can uh, learn when we start to release new videos. Uh, can be battle reports, what to build, or tacticals, this kind of thing. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this video. And until the next time, keep uh, spreading the love all around you. Bye.